Welcome Boulder Symphony fans. I'm Devin Patrick Hughes. I'm so excited to be with you tonight on our virtual virtuoso series. We have Anton Nell, pianist and piano professor at Butler School of Music at UT Austin. Anton was born in Johannesburg. Uh, he's, he's taught piano uh, at all around the world, including University of Michigan, Manhattan School of Music. He was the winner of the Walter Naumberg Piano Competition in 1987. And he's also a harpsichordist and a piano fortist. And you can hear his most recent recordings uh, with the Austin Symphony and Peter Bay. It's the Piano Works, the Divertimento and Piano Concerti of Edward Burlingame Hill, an early American composer, early 20th century American composer, uh, who taught Bernstein, Carter, uh, uh, Thompson, and many others. Uh, Anton also has a show on KMFA Austin called Piano Forte. Uh, so Anton, welcome to uh, our Virtual Virtuoso series. We're so honored that, you, uh, that you're joining us tonight. And I just wanted to start out with uh, just what are you doing these days to stay sane and keep uh, busy and, and, to, and teaching wise? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's, as I just said to you earlier, it's nice to have something to do. <laughs> Although the summer has been very unusual in the sense that I've been home, it has been productive in its own way since I've learned some repertoire. I don't think I fulfilled my entire wish list. It wasn't as motivating as I'd hoped. But I taught all through the summer virtually and um, did some various festival things. A lot of recording in my home, um, a lot of walking, a lot of cooking and baking, and a lot of studying, a lot of listening to music. It was not uninteresting, but I'm getting ready to go out a little bit and traveling that's for sure and what what was your new recipe well i have a terrible sweet tooth so i must confess <laughs> that i've gotten rather good at making pastry oh baking bread and making puddings and also ice cream amazing in fact as soon as we are done with our interview the bread should be raised risen. wow that's incredible I'll, I'll i'll speed it up then <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's not. It's not that uh, intricate. It, it could do its own thing. Starting with this Mozart, which was written uh, in 1782. Can can you talk about why uh, you you chose this piece to open your program? I, well, first of all, I should say that I just absolutely love everything that I play. So when I choose it, it's normally because I love it. But this particular um, Mozart is probably my favorite composer, and this is just one of my most favorite of his sort of occasional pieces. Mm -hmm. I think what's marvelous about it is that the, it's basically based on one theme. There's mm -hmm. only one theme in the piece that comes along in different keys and how he makes them all somehow sound different is just mm -hmm. so creative and brilliant. Mm -hmm. And as with all Mozart, he achieves so much with so little. So, and, the, and there's also um, listeners who, who might not be familiar with this particular piece, there's a little quotation from Eine Kleine Nachtmusik that was, that was actually written later. Um, can you talk about that correlation or Mozart uh, potentially borrowing from himself? Yes, um, actually he certainly does that. And in this particular piece, he also uses the opening theme in an earlier work in his piano quartet in G minor. Mm -hmm. And when you hear it the first time, you go, where did I hear that before? And then of course you realize that it was something that was later. Mm -hmm. It's like so many other people, he does borrow from himself. You know, Handel was a positive El Cheapo in that regard. I mean, he borrowed and rewrote himself all the time. Mozart here and there a little bit. Thank you so much. Uh, we're really looking forward to your entire concert. And um, I'll be available. I think Anton may be available uh, during the program. If you have any comments or questions about the composers or the, or the piano or any any other things that you wanted to know, please let us know. If you are able and you're listening tonight uh, and you're able to make a donation, uh, we cannot do this without your support. So there's gonna be a little bit of information right here down below uh, to donate to Boulder Symphony for future performances and educational projects. Um, and so one more time, thank you so much, uh, Professor Anton Nell for joining us tonight. And we are looking forward to your recital. Thank you, Maestro. It's a pleasure to be with you.
is Robert Schumann, and you're going to play the fantasy in C major. Uh, this was written in 1836. So uh, we know Schumann was in love with the student of his piano teacher, uh, Clara Wieck, and, and, and this relationship. And then, of course, when Brahms enters in the 1850s, this is the, the item of conspiracy theories and all classical music speculation that has ever happened. Um, yeah. But in this, in 1836, Schumann had not yet um, basically been allowed to marry Clara because she had not turned of age. Um, so in, in this Schumann, I think it's Hegel um, that he, that he um, quotes here, resounding through all the notes in the earth's colorful dream, there sounds a faint long drone note for the one who listens in secret. Um, so, so the question is, and of course he subtitled this movement with fantasy and passion throughout, which I think encapsulates Schumann's entire life. Um, yeah. Can you talk about uh, that, that, that correlation or what, what of Clara is in this music and, and how you approach it? Oh gosh, absolutely. Well, first of all, let me just say that the Schumann fantasy is one of the greatest pieces in the piano repertoire. Mm -hmm. And I'm just learning it now for the first mm -hmm. time. I'm yeah. having last doing so. But it is he himself said that it's the most passionate thing that he has ever written. Mm. Because there was, you know, there was this extraordinary love for this woman who he just thought did not really have access to, as it were. So the whole work is full of this sort of so-called Clara motive, which is this descending fifth that you hear in so many of these things. The whole piece is full of it. Mm. Um, and it's full of this passion and yearning. And there's this old folk story that is being told in the middle of the first movement but you know there is a connection between this piece and beethoven who we just spoke about mm. there is a, a a quotation that runs it appears again uh in the third movement in the first movement there's a big quotation from beethoven's song cycle on the yeah. Yeah. the distant yeah. beloved and it, it's from the last song where it says you know take away take away these songs that you have sung mm -hmm. and it's so the whole piece, I think, if you really start digging into it, is full of these a secret messages and numbers and motives and things that connect all of it together. It just this whole secret language between the two of them. It's remarkable. It's just um, the greatest piece. And for somebody maybe who doesn't, um, who isn't as familiar with the history of Sh the Schumanns, and um, can you say, is there anything to listen to that they should be keeping an eye out for? In this one, um, the structure of it, just, just the plane following along, is actually quite clear. You will hear a very passionate and sort of stormy. You, oh, this, is, I, this, would, this would be nice for the listeners to know. For those of you who don't know so much about Schumann, he has himself and also in his music these alter egos mm -hmm. that he projects in his music. And there are, and it's kind of with his personality. He kind of had a I suppose nowadays you would call it a manic depressive kind of personality. And the manic side, which was the, the passionate, impetuous side, was called Florestan. So whenever you hear any music, and sometimes in these pieces too, it could be dedicated to Florestan or written by Florestan. So you hear a lot of the Florestan things right away. But then there is also the dreamy, contemplative side, which is Eusebius, mm -hmm. E-U-S-E-B-I-U-S. -E -E which is the dreamy part. And you hear a lot of that too. And then sometimes the two, you know, are at the, happen at the same time. This particular one has a lot of Florestan in it. Mm -hmm. But at the end, the quotation from Beethoven comes in and the whole thing winds down in this sort of magical way. And often there are these, I don't want to say a random, but these sort of long sounds that seem to come out of nowhere which in a literal way could be the secret tone that he talks about in the motto in the beginning. Mm. Although a lot of that is, for, is, is more deeply hidden in the piece. Mm. But it is something that is uh, wonderful to listen to. And the piece is dedicated to Franz Liszt. Mm.
So the, the last piece on the program, uh, we go to France with Emmanuel Chabrier. Um, and this is uh, a scherzo waltz from, from 10 uh, pictorial pieces. And um, Chabrier was very interesting as well. He studied law, he was a clerk, he was a very amateur composer until the age of 40. Then he decided to quit his day job and focus 100% on, on music. Uh, he was friends with Manet. Um, this suite that you're going to play was also orchestrated, so there is an orchestral version. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, about uh, Chabrier and, and, and the, the Scherzo Waltz? Oh, well, it's a cute piece. That's all I have to say. It's a little bit, excuse me if I'm offending people under drinking age. This is like popping a really superb bottle of champagne. <laughs> the piece just bubbles with joy and yeah. good humor and with fun. It's the last piece in this set of 10 pieces, and, and they're all delightful. They're, they're sort of country scenes and whirlwinds and idylls, and just it's it's all it's all very sweet. Actually, it's a he is a fine composer that again is is often overlooked because of everything else. I think, for example, some of his orchestra music, like the you know España. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a fine piece. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I love it. There's some oper there's some operatic music. Yeah, uh, some excellent songs. I and he's underestimated. And I I just enjoy playing this piece. I mean, he wrote a bunch of short piano pieces. There's nothing big. But uh, uh, this, as part of a, a group on a recital, is nice, or it's an excellent encore. 